he got into some sort of uh, uh, intellectual, uh, it was only like a, a, a record skipping. He kept asking the same question over and over again. Pastor, who is not a man who uh, uh, exaggerates at all, said about 500 times. He was asking the same question over and over, and that's very worrisome. And Bill is a relatively young man. You know, it's interesting how that changes, right? <laughs> you know, yeah, absolutely. You know, I hear somebody has passed away at 82, and now I'm thinking, oh, so young still. Wow, really? You know, meanwhile, you know, my son is like, he was 82. Oh, well, I mean, Dad. I'm like, Dad, what? Anyway, uh, but uh, he got tested multiple times, probably more times than he needed to because he didn't want to go in the tube. Just go in the tube, Bill, and they'll know. And you know, but it's tough, you know. Some people, I I don't like it in the tube and all that. Tung, 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 tung. Anyway, um, but he is he is okay and he is headed home and we should see him next Wednesday. Father in Jesus' name, thank you, Lord, that Bill is okay. Please minister to Cheryl. She must be fritzing a little bit. Uh, so, Lord, bring her peace, and in the name of Jesus, we ask that you would open our minds and our hearts to receive the fullness of your word that you have for us tonight. Make us sharp, scalpel-like instruments to not only minister to those who need it, but also, Lord, to be able to call out to you uh, uh, with wisdom and faith for the answers that we personally need. In Jesus' name, we all say amen. Okay, everybody take this down, by the way. This is my name. This is my email. This is my phone number. Please have it. Please be more than welcome to call uh, at 24-7, because I turn my phone off anyway, so I won't hear you. But uh, at, at, at the very least, I'll get your voicemail in, in, in the morning. But uh, make sure you have that. Uh, uh, especially, I like questions. I respond very, very quickly to text. Uh, 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 I, if I'm in the mood, I'll pick up the phone, generally speaking. When you're calling, I see it's you, and I'll just send you a voicemail. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. I actually, I have one little button that says, uh, your call has been declined because you've been identified as spam. And I, I love sending that to her sometimes as a joke. Anyway. Um, no, I'm just kidding. Look at the women. God. They're it, definitely in your cam. It's... So we are talking about overcoming. We are talking about overcoming in the Christian life. We want to be, we see, we see the promise of Scripture is that he wants us to be more than overcomers. So this is called the overcoming series, but in actuality, Scripture says, I want you to become more than overcomers. Now what more than overcomers means is when these different problems assail us, fear, anger, sorrow, say that with me, Fear, anger, sorrow. One more time. Fear, anger, sorrow. These are the core. These are at the core of just about every temptation that man can face. When we are faced with it, we can overcome it ourselves. But the whole point of Christianity is becoming more of an overcomer means you now become somebody who is used by the Lord to help and enable other people to overcome. There is nothing God ever gives anybody, not money, not time, not uh, leisure, not uh, food, not any resource, uh, no talent, no skill, no gift. There's nothing God gives you that he does not mean or intend for you to share. Nothing. And, uh, uh, and we don't have time to go into it this evening, but one of the foundational principles of Jesus is more will be given to he who distributes and shares that which has been given to him. As you have been given, so give, right? And here's the thing. Uh, whatever you need more of, and Gary, I don't know if you have found this to be true in your life. I have. But when I need something and I identify what that thing is that I need, if I start giving it, even the little last bit that I have, suddenly now the wellsprings of God's generosity, mercy, and grace open up and now it starts flooding into my life. How many have found that true? Say amen. If that is the case and you truly know that, then brother and sister, you and I should never be in lack. Because we always know in our heart, in our spirit, in our mind, the way to tap into more from God is to give the very thing that we need away to people who need it. And a lot of people kind of constrict 
uh, uh, the application of these things to tactile items that they can identify. Okay, so if I need more money, I feel like I'm in financial distress, I should give money away. True. I'm talking more about the true treasure that Jesus is talking about. If you are lonely and you feel unloved, you need to identify people in your life that you can pour love onto. If you feel like you are being treated unfairly, you need to identify people in your life that you can shower with mercy that they do not deserve. If you feel as though you should be getting more blessing from God and others and the world around you and what on earth is stopping it, well, according to Jesus, who we all serve and love, amen, you need to be giving grace to those around to stop this worldly, and we'll, we'll talk about that this morning, so the core of what we're going to, uh, or, or evening, this is what we're going to talk about this evening, is, is, is giving that we might receive. And being able to distribute the fruit of the spirit-filled life that we are all called to engage in. So how many would say amen to that? God wants to use you, and the way he's going to use you and open up blessing you is by you initializing the process. It's almost like uh, 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 causing fresh air to come in the room by opening a window and, and turning on an exhaust fan. And the second that happens, fresh air must come in. And so it's true of us, and especially in the, in the fruit of the Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit area. What you feel you need spiritually, what you feel you need intellectually, what you feel you need emotionally, you just need to start giving and identifying ways in which you can give. And uh, uh, giving is a spiritual gift found in Romans chapter 12. We're going to talk about that. But giving, the spirit of giving, and you being identified as a giver. How many people, by the way, just in passing, feel that God has gifted you as a giver? Okay. Here's the thing. You may be gifted as a giver, spiritual gifts, Romans chapter 12, but we are all called to be givers. For instance, there are people who have the spiritual gift of healing, but all of us are called to pray for healing. Anytime. Somebody say anytime. Anytime you run into anybody who is sick and needs healing, we as Christians, especially we who consider ourselves to be spirit-filled Christians are supposed to be praying for healing everywhere we go. She will tell you. Don Gunn will tell you. And I'll tell you of Nancy Lancor, who's actually worse than me, that we'll be at a restaurant. And are you feeling okay? Oh, I've just been under the weather lately. Oh, well, good, great. Let me pray for you. And here's, here's the thing. I don't know if Nancy Lancor has the spiritual gift found in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 of healing or not. Because uh, she's been praying for my mental facilities for years and <laughs> doesn't seem to do much. You know what she has the gift of is word of knowledge. And she has, if boldness was a spiritual gift, she, she has it in gobs. But anyway, it, 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 it's what initiates and starts the flow of the Spirit moving in your life, is giving away that which you have. So, I, I want you to turn initially to last week's Overcoming Series number four, God is the Only True Answer, and we're going to cap all this off. Remember, we were, we were talking about last week uh, uh, the complexity of the landscape of counseling and therapy, and what I was trying to explain to you and emphasize were the words of Jesus as he was dealing with Martha in Luke chapter 10, where she is worried primarily about making sure the party is taken care of, and she's got strangers in her house, and any decent, good Jewish woman is going to want to take care of these things, and no doubt she had neighbor women of hers uh, that were looking at Mary, who was sitting at the feet, feet of Jesus, shaking their head, going, oh, that young girl should be helping her older sister. And instead, Jesus introduces a completely different line of thinking, away from the carnal, which again, we're going to talk about tonight, and into the spirit realm, showing us that this pattern, 
The pattern of preferring the spirit realm to the carnal realm. Let me say that again. Preferring the spirit realm and the priorities of the spirit realm to the carnal realm are what initiate blessing, not only spiritually, but also spilling into the carnal realm. Did you catch that? When you start serving and living life in the Spirit and start preferring and making a priority of the things of God and the things of the Spirit, then these things will... Anybody hear a line like this before from somebody? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, then what happens? All these things shall be added to you. So rather than focus on all these carnal things that we concern ourselves about, and we are Martha, Martha, you are worried and anxious and concerned about many things, you pray to the Holy Spirit for discernment of some spiritual area that He wants you focused upon. Generally speaking, if you're confused and you don't know where to emphasize your attention on, Wherever you attend church on Sunday and whatever your pastor told you Sunday morning, since he was the prophet of the day that the Lord sent you to, is probably a great place to start because the Holy Spirit had you there for that reason. But as you emphasize those spiritual things, these things will naturally come into being. I know, uh, 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 and, and pastor knows him too, David and Doris Godwin, and, uh, you know, he's still preaching at 90 years old. He's older than Chuck. And he's still preaching. He just came back from another triple missionary trip. Like, the guy is insane. And I asked him, the last time he was at our house, I said, so do you spend a lot of time exercising? Do you watch your diet? Do you have to watch after this thing? He says, you know, I, I got to tell you, brother, when all I do is I... I spend all my time focused on what, it, what the Holy Ghost wants. I never know how much time I'm going to have left. Fifteen minutes, ten minutes, you never know. You know. But he said he just focuses on the spiritual things. And he just trusts God will take care of the other things. He said, I don't even spend much time praying about it. I spend all my time interceding for, Lord, what do you want me to, to say to this crowd here? Tomorrow night I'm going to be ministering to a, a group of uh, pre-Christians, we like to call them, but unbelievers. Uh, in a prison, and, and I'm not going to spend my time, oh Lord, please heal my broken toe. You know, instead, I'm going to be asking the Holy Ghost, to tell me what is, what is I'm supposed to say, and call, calling out to Him for the anointing and the blood to cover me. And then all of a sudden, as I'm walking on a platform, and I'm about ready to open my Bible and lead them to John 3.16, I notice in passing as I'm reading, my toe is fine. I sought first the kingdom of God. Then all the rest of these things just came. See, the tendency is, and this is the vacillation in the, in the land of, of, of counseling, even Christian counseling, sad to say, in some cases, not all but some cases, is a focus on not only the carnal need, but the carnal technique of meeting that need. Instead of looking for an answer from God, we are focused on some sort of tactile behavior or thing that we can do that ministers to it. And as we're going to start studying, the Lord has the answer. Here in verse 42, Jesus says something that is very difficult to escape. And we, this was how we uh, capped off last week's lesson. But only one thing is needed. And that is what Mary had chosen, and to sit at the feet of Jesus. That, if I am not missing the point entirely, means, John, that when Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, he means regardless of what the need is. Doesn't matter if you're afraid, doesn't matter if you're angry, doesn't matter if you're overwhelmed with sorrow and grief, and you're depressed, and you're frustrated, or you're freaked out, or you're fritzing, or you're stressing, or you're amping, or whatever it is you're doing. Sitting at the feet of Jesus... And we do that by prayer, we do that by praise, we do that by worship, we do that by study, we do that by reading His Word. When we sit at the feet of Jesus, that is the one thing that is needed to address all the rest of this stuff. If that's the case, you don't need any degree to counsel anybody. In fact, I would highly resist the notion that a degree makes you any more capable 
of bringing the grace and the mercy and the gospel of Jesus to anybody who's in need. Now, does it give you a better education? Over and, and, you know, I, I love education. I mean, I, I went all the way, twice. Still, it doesn't make me any closer to God. Let me testify of that for just a second. Uh, 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 I went to cemetery, seminary, excuse me. Yeah, and, uh, well, it's, it's where a lot of on-fire believers go to die, trust me. And pastor knows I'm, I'm, I'm telling the truth, and I'm being very transparent with you guys. I saw a lot of people lose their faith, frankly, at four. Uh, and they, they came as on-fire, trusting God, and they hear all this gobbledygook about exegesis and hermeneutics and systematic theology, and now suddenly they're questioning everything, and at the end of the day... Fuller Seminary, uh, my alma mater, has abandoned the infallibility of Scripture, as has Dallas Theological Seminary, as has Talbot, and as has, uh, uh, what's the other big one? Actually, those are the three, Dallas, Fuller, and, and Talbot. But all three, I don't know about them, but all those three that I just named have abandoned the infallibility of Scripture. Uh, and now they just rest on something they call the authority of Scripture insofar as it's correctly translated. And my response to that is, who are you, Joseph Smith? Because that's exactly what you'll hear from a Mormon, is do you trust the authority of the Word of God? Do you trust the Bible? And their answer, their standard pat answer, yes, the Bible is an authority insofar as it's correctly translated, which is very slippery coming from some, somebody who primarily rests upon a theological source, the Book of Mormon, that there is no manuscript to. So by your own standard, I can't actually check your source. Your source is unsubstantiatable and unable, I'm unable to validate your source, but you want to somehow have me accept that source as a higher authority above Scripture that I know is infallible. So it, it, it's a wild word. But anyway, getting back to the point, what I'm trying to say is this. Every single person who knows Jesus, who loves Jesus, and who understands how to get into the presence of the Lord is qualified to counsel anybody who is in any type of trouble because I am told by Scripture only one thing is needed, and that is to learn the words of Jesus. Amen? Okay, so anyway... Uh, uh, and he says, Mary has chosen what is better. I, I ran out of time, and I wanted to emphasize this for you. Uh, the word chosen uh, 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 is, is uh, ekolo, uh, logomai, and that is the aorist indicative uh, uh, mid-voice, and I know that doesn't mean much to you, but what it does mean is this. It is a transitive word that is supposed to emphasize and define another word. That is the word better. Aga the ne mer ida eskele escato. Mary has chosen. The way she has, what, what this basically means is this. Everybody see this line right here? Mary has chosen what is better. Say that with me. Mary has chosen what is better. Okay. The parsing of this means. The way she has chosen determines how much better the better is. The way she has chosen, because this is the aorist indicative mid uh, 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 adjective, defines how better the better is. Let me say it another way. How much blessing is Jesus going to bring into the situation? How much intrusion is the power of the Holy Spirit going to have in your situation and circumstance? How much latitude is God going to have in the situation you're in is based upon how you choose to apply and how you choose to be attentive to the words of Jesus. The, uh, another way of putting it is this. God was able to move powerfully in Mary's life in this case because she had chosen what was better, sitting at his feet. His implication here is, and by the way, everything I just said to Mary and all the life-changing stuff I just said to Mary, you missed. You missed it. And for me, uh, what that means when it comes to applying myself in pastoral or Christian counseling is, or godly counsel is what I like calling it, is this, 
If I emphasize some other tack, I am grinding up airspace, I'm taking their attention span, and I'm basically spending my time sharing with them and teaching them something that is not scripturally based. And I am using and I'm applying myself in a way that is more carnal than spiritual. I want to be speaking the words of Jesus and reminding them what the gospel of Jesus is so that they can be moved more into the realm of the Spirit. Second uh, Corinthians, at the bottom of your page there, take a look at it. Second Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4 through 7. As we are doing battle with forces that want to steal, kill, and destroy. Remember we talked about that two weeks ago. The devil, the enemy comes but to steal, kill, and destroy. These people who stand up for the world, they come to steal, kill, and destroy. We want to do battle with that. We want to do battle with what we identify as uh, counterculture, secular humanism. Paul referred to it in, in his epistles as uh, Gnosticism. Gnosticism just basically, if, it's, if I can't see it, if I can't touch it, then it's not real. We, meaning faith is, in, is invalid and it's something that never, never, never is used. Well, speaking to that point, the Holy Spirit through Paul says, 2 Corinthians 10, 4, the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. So we have been given, according to the Holy Spirit, weapons that are not carnal, not carnal, not carnal, i.e., they are not a result of physical exer exertion with the body. They are not uh, something that uh, requires huge intellect of the mind. It is not something that is going to require a gargantuan investment of the heart. But this is a different kind of weapon that God, is, that God has given us. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. So if you see anybody trying to bring into a lesson into a counseling, into a teaching, into a sermon in any church, on TV or on the radio, and trying to introduce principles that are not found in Scripture, but rather are substantiated because science has said this, and, and, and this organization has said this, and this school has said this, and CNN has said this, and CBS has said this. This Scripture tells me the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world, not of the world. On the contrary, and, he, and the Holy Spirit emphasizes this point, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. So now we are not talking about physical power. We're not talking about intellectual power. We're not talking about emotional power. This means it doesn't matter what degree or education I have. It does not matter what my emotional bent is, and I'm not supposed to be using some sort of emotional tool to manipulate somebody into feeling that way. Okay, if you take an education at the grad level, you'll understand how to use something referred to as NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming. The whole foundation is a matter of establishing rapport with somebody, using that rapport that I've now established to reframe you to get you to think a certain way. And once I can reframe you and I can, I can see your mind is moving around, now I'm supposed to do something called trancing and introduce a whole new ideological set. Because now you trust me, now you feel you and I are the same, and now whatever I feed into your head, your brain is open now, and you're just going to absorb it. And that's a very real thing. That's a tactile style and form of communication that you are taught in grad school. I was taught it. I used to use it in sales. It's very, very powerful. And if all you care about is making a, a one-point sale and you're not, you're not interested in building clientele, you just want to make this one sale, you can do it. But this scripture is telling me those kinds of things are not what you are supposed to be using. Now, if you don't mind me getting on a, 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 a pet peeve of mine, uh, uh, and not to mention any names, but if you see anybody on TV, hear anybody on the radio, go to a church and see them incorporating or using styles and manners of influence 
that they have learned from the world, whether that is a style of music, whether that is a smoke machine, whether that is a laser, when it starts looking more and more and more like the world and less and less and less like heaven, you got a problem. Because the weapons we fight with are not supposed to be carnal. They are not supposed to be of the world. We are supposed to be fighting as people who want to not only be more effective uh, for the Lord, and we want to have more peace in our lives and be able to love God more, love others more, uh, exercise mercy and exercise grace more. We need to be courting the spiritual side and resisting the carnal side. And so as things are introduced to us, even in sermons, even in churches, that I can tell that stylization of homiletic is actually worldly and carnal. He's using salesmanship. He's not using the gospel. He is trying to craft some very skillful story and emotional manipulation to make his point. But this is not something that the Holy Spirit taught him. This is something that the world has taught him. And he is imitating somebody, which is another danger sign, by the way. Anytime you see anybody up there talking or speaking, and you can clearly tell he's trying to imitate somebody else. Well, the only person we're supposed to be imitating is Jesus. Okay, but if they're trying to imitate and they're trying to be like somebody else, you got an issue. Even the stylization that can be kind of global. Remember the old days, if you want to sound holy, right, in the old days, our parents' days, you had to be Scottish. And I want you to know that the words of Jesus are going to break through in your heart. You know, and that, that kind of moved you. And then, you know, in the 80s, it was uh, Southern. Who wants to talk about Jesus today? I'm going to tell you right now, the Holy Ghost is in the house. He may or may not be. But you're certainly going to hear about it one way or the other. Now it's Australian. Praise God. Spirit of Jesus is just here. Just drink it in. I'm like, okay, well, I can tell what you've been drinking, and I ain't falling for it because here's the problem with all that. The giveaway is it's all stylization. Anytime you get into a certain venue, it's got to have this vibe going on. Jesus is not relying on, upon a vibe here. This is, the, he's, he's got his own vibe, amen? On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. Now, when you stick with the gospel of Jesus, when you stick with the words of Jesus, when you stick with the power of prayer, when you rely upon the anointing of the Holy Spirit that may or may not be in agreement with the social mores of the day, what you find is God begins to move supernaturally. God starts to take over and he comes on the scene because the weapons we fight with must be powerful to demolish strongholds. They must have the divine nature. If it's a product of something intellectual, that's an exercise. The product of something that is an emotional manipulation, it's a product of a social influence. This is not going to elucidate healing. It'll elucidate change. I can change somebody. I can show you there's a difference in them. I can use NLP and change somebody's mind. That doesn't mean they're healed. It, generally speaking, you trade in one, one mental illness for another or one spiritual is, issue for another. But if you want to see true healing, true regeneration, and true transformation of mind and heart to take place, there's only one way that that can happen. That's with the words of Jesus. So we're going to stick with that as we study counseling, as we study overcoming. Is that all right? Okay. So the, the, the divine weapons. Now, I, 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 I don't mean any offense, uh, but I'm a theologian, so I don't really care. Uh, here's the thing. We need to identify what these... Uh, 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 divine power strong, uh, to, de de to demolish strong, strong uh, and it says so right here in the next verse the divine weapons that we are talking about we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets it up against the knowledge of God we take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ stop for a second before we go on so here in this very verse that is used to justify some wildly unscriptural practices of spiritual warfare. 
We'll, we'll, we'll start there. It actually identifies within its own context what practice and orthopraxy holds the key to releasing the divine power to demolish strongholds. How many people here want to release divine power to demolish strongholds? Not great ideas, not cute strategies, not emotional manipulation, but resisting those things engage in things that will introduce divine power that will demolish strongholds. If you're interested in that, you have to go on to the next verse where it defines what those uh, uh, weapons are. To demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself self up against the knowledge of God. So we have to become resistant to any ideas that are carnal. We have to make war on those things. Now this tells me a couple things initially. Number one, that in order to release divine power to demolish strongholds, where is the battleground? The battleground is in the soul. The battleground is in the soul. So, and I don't think for a second we're going to finish, but we are going to start. The battleground for spiritual dominion in your life is your soul. Suke, soul. The soul consists of the mind, the heart, which are thoughts, emotions, and the combination of these two things, the mind and the heart, are what form what the Bible refers to as the will. You can sometimes just refer to it as the desires of the heart. Okay? So this is where the battleground is. Now, the soul, where your mind is, where your heart is, and the combination application of what you think and what you feel will establish your desires, will establish your will, and this will is what we're battling with because if this will is focused on carnal things and is wanting to engage in the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, if that's where the drives and the desires are, then there's something wrong in here, and there's something wrong in here. Now, if there's something wrong in here, and there's something wrong in here, then something is generating gobbledygook in here. Now, what could that be? Okay, the soul, the mind, and the heart have two different sources, initially, in Eden, of input. So we'll just call this input. Number one is spiritual. This is God. And there's spiritual input into the soul. There's also carnal. So there's the spirit, there's the body that is carnal. And it also introduces input into the soul. And both body and spirit, in Adam's case, could see hear, feel, smell, taste. There are these senses that are indigenous in the spirit body as well as the physical body and they form input that goes into here. So, I'm walking around in Eden and it looks to my physical eyes as though it's perfectly safe. And then suddenly I use my spiritual eyes, Lord revealed to me what is out there, and suddenly I realize there are demons around here trying to mess around with my wife. So where I am is not a safe place, it's actually a dangerous place, but now that I can see all that, and I become aware of the spiritual warfare that's happening, I can do something about it. Or on the other side, Elijah is there with his, or Elisha with his servant. And his servant is worried that they're going to be overcome by all the forces of, you know, the, 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 the kingdom. And this is how many of us can feel these days as we watch the news, as we're surrounded by family and friends, as we walk around in the culture that we're immersed in, that we are alone, that we are overwhelmed, that we have no weapons to fight with 
that we are going to be overcome, that our children are going to be overcome, that our grandchildren will be overcome, that all, uh, we've all become a, 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 a church and a congregation full of victims that could do nothing about it. And woe is us, and oh my gosh, what's going to happen to us? And Elijah the prophet prays and says, Oh Lord, open, their eye, open his eyes that he may truly see. Because he is seeing in the carnal. He sees all this. He sees all this on CNN. He sees all this on YouTube. He sees all this on Tic Tac. He sees all these things everywhere. And he's freaking out. And the, and, and the prophet decides, Okay, he needs to open this up again. So there's spiritual input. And as that happens, somebody tell me the story. What does, what does the servant of the prophet see? What? Angels, armies, chariots, all there to help. In the spirit they are there. And suddenly he realizes this is, called, this is a real reframe. Now I'm seeing in the spirit, no longer in the flesh. Folks, if you are consuming yourself with seeing your life and your family's life and your friends' lives and your church situation and your work situation in the flesh, you are going to be freaked out. It is not meant to be a friendly place for you. If the world hated me, Jesus said, it's going to hate you. So it shouldn't shock you that you are not popular, especially when you spout this gobbledygook about Jesus and salvation and sin and heaven and hell. They're not going to want to listen to that. But if you will cry out to the Holy Spirit and say, Holy Spirit, you know what? I need a kind of a way, I, I need a reframe. I need a, a kind of wake-up call. Can you, in the name of Jesus, help me see the spiritual side? You know what the Holy Spirit's going to tell you? Sure, absolutely. Do me a favor. Meditate upon what's vexing you, and what's giving you stress, and what's giving you problems, and start praying in the Spirit a little bit like my Word says. Okay, well, I'm thinking about the situation with my daughter-in-law, Hoku, and I'm thinking about that. It's, it's so awful. It's so stressful. And do what he says. You can feel it from here. I'm not doing anything. That's just a release of the Holy Spirit's power and his presence. That's it. But he wants to pour that all over you. That's why all this is important. Because all these things serve to accomplish exactly what Scripture says. Because this... We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Well, who's supposed to do that? This is a citation to you. This is an exhortation to the very person who wants to have divine power to demolish strongholds in operation in their life. This is to you. So it is, even to the Holy Spirit, speaking to the Corinthian church 2,000 years ago, the whole point is, the battle is in the soul. Now, this means prayer. This means spending time in praise and worship every day. This means reading the Word of God on a daily basis. This means fellowshipping with unbelievers, not forsaking the gathering together of the saints, and that does not have to be just on Sunday or Wednesday, but can be a daily thing where you make a special effort. Okay, every day I'm going to reach out to, and I want to fellowship with some believer somewhere. I need to call somebody. I need to text somebody. But there has to be fellowship. I need to engage in this. I need to minister to somebody and have somebody minister to me who is godly and, 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 and scriptural and spirit-filled and covered by the blood, walking with God, walking with the Holy Ghost, living the life of the Spirit, which apparently we're not going to have time to flesh out tonight, but we'll start talking about next week. But all this introduces into your mind and into your heart divine weapons, divine weapons that demolish strongholds, not only in you, but then remember what we started out with. Anything the Lord wants to do for you, He wants you sharing. Oftentimes I hear uh, believers, Gary, 
saying, why is this going on? Why is this happening to me? What did I do, Lord, to uh, 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 cause these things and these kind of problems to assail me? And the answer is, you prayed the dumb prayer. You were stupid enough because there is Pastor Ricky and he knew the Holy Spirit wanted to do something calling up prayer and, and having guys fall for if you feel like the Holy Spirit wants you to reconsecrate and rededicate your life and surrender your will to Him so that He can use more effectively in the kingdom of God and you want to put Jesus first, come forward. You were dumb enough to come up. And you lack discernment, you let Him lay His hands on you. And when you woke up, you were transformed and changed. I'll tell you what was transformed and changed. Number one, you were wiser, because that's promised to us by Scripture. We're going to study that next week. You had more love for God, more love for everybody else. That's something else that's promised to you. The Holy Spirit was in operation deeper in your life. And also, you see your life in front of you, your relationships and your situations and your circumstances. Those tracks got changed a little bit, because now He has to train you to be able to minister to the mission that he is going to send you to because you volunteer to do whatever he wants. And he knows this. He knows somewhere out there, there's a tomb. He knows somewhere out there, there's a dead man that needs to be raised up. There's a family that needs to be raised up. There's a youth that needs to be raised up. And he's, they are, she is, behind the stone of a tomb that stinketh. And everybody around that tomb is saying, don't open that thing up. Don't go there because it stinketh. And Jesus is looking for somebody who's going to say, I don't care how it smells. Roll the stone back. Because God wants to do something. And he wants to use you to do it. But he has to send you down this track to teach you. I will tell you this, over the years, I found this to be true. How many times have we seen it, sweetheart? where people are going through a hard time and they will ask, why am I going through this? And the simple answer that we see work its way through is God has a mission for you. You volunteered for this. It's like Tom Cruise, remember, you wanted this. And now you are going to have to walk through this process unless you want to go ahead and pray. I can, I can lead you in the prayer. Lord, I didn't mean it. Lord, I have changed my mind. Price is too steep. Thank you for all that bleeding on the cross. That was nice. But you did it for everybody else too, not just for me. Let's be honest. And now as I have been walking this path, I realize I'm not enjoying myself. And so uh, I would like to be, uh, I, I think I'm going to withdraw from this class. And I'm going to take a, 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 a no credit, uh, and we'll, we'll move on and we'll do it later. And if you want to pray that way, go right ahead. At least it's honest. But if you really want to be used by God, and you really want him to raise you up and teach you how to possess weapons of divine nature that will demolish strongholds in your own mind and in your own heart, so that you can be used by the Holy Ghost to do the same thing for others around you. If you really feel like, Lord, you're needed here. Lord, you have to come through. Lord, there's these people in trouble. Lord, there's this church in trouble. Lord, there's this family in trouble. Lord, there's this woman in trouble. Lord, there's this guy in trouble. My kids are in trouble. Please come help. His answer is, I am trying by raising you up. I am trying to prepare you to be used by me to do these things. But in order for you to do that, I need you to allow me to transform your mind and transform your heart so that it is not being fed by things you see that are carnal, but you see, hear, feel, and smell not in the carnal, but in the spiritual. I need you to minimize this intentionally ignore this, intentionally disregard this, 
and focus on this. And the only way that's going to work, the only way that's going to happen is for you to pray more, worship more, praise Him more, read the Word of God more. It won't work to just come here on Wednesday and listen to me yap at you. This that we're talking about here, divine power, everybody say power, divine power to demolish strongholds, this is something that has to happen in your mind and in your heart if you want the world around you to be impacted and affected. Jesus is in the business of making disciples and raising them up and sending them out. And he wants to use you and send you. What he does not necessarily want is for you to sit there and pray and say, Lord, please send somebody else. Because that's what Moses tried and it didn't work for him. He wants to send you. He wants to raise you up. And you will find that your relationship with him, your walk with him will be blessed, will be empowered. And you will have a life with Jesus like you never had before. And at the end of the day, isn't that all what, what it's about? Don't you want to walk with Jesus tighter and closer? And allow the spirit realm to become more real so that he can bless you more and walk with you more and talk with you more and share with you more. Let's complete this and we will be ready to punish every act of uh, disobedience once your obedience is complete. You see verse 6? Look at it carefully, because this is we're already well into the realm of where nobody wants to go. This is, again, this is from last week's notes, overcoming series number four, God is the only true answer, second part, but we're just completing the scripture in first, uh, 2 Corinthians 10, 4, 5, now we're in 6, and we will be ready to punish every act of disobedience. Everybody there? Once your obedience is complete. The Holy Spirit is speaking to you and I, saying, I got to work on you first. Then I can send you out. I can use you to heal your family, but I need to work on you first. I can use you to heal this church. I can use you to heal this marriage. I can use you to heal these youth, but I need to change you first. That's what this verse 6 is all about. You are looking, and finally the citation from Paul. This, this is so Pauline. You are looking only on the surface things. If anyone is confident he belongs to Christ, he should consider again that we belong to Christ just as much as he. In other words, let God work on us first. It strikes me as familiar that somebody, maybe you know who it is, what movie this is from, said, take the log out of your own eye before you try to remove the speck from somebody else's. Was that Tom Selleck? Was that? No, it was somebody else though, right? Jesus was it? Okay. That's better. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you, Lord, for this time. We want to avail ourselves to you. Father, in Jesus' name, I just ask you to deal with anybody who's here. Uh, we come to this class because we are very, very aware that there are needs, spiritual needs, emotional needs, intellectual needs around us. We see people suffering. We see people dying. We want to acknowledge tonight, and this is you, just whisper amen to him. Lord, there is only one thing needed. They need to hear you. They need to receive the gospel. They need to be shown what your word says. They need to be prayed for. They need to be led to a position of salvation, fellowship, to be sent out themselves one day to minister in mission. And we give you praise and thanks for tonight. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. Thank you. See you next week. There you go. And what's the, what's the latest movie he just did? What? Son of Freedom.